Why me, Lord? What if I ever done to deserve He? Pleasures I've known. Well, tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you? What kind did you show?
he died yesterday or the day before. Well, they had services today. Uh, we had a shooting on the road today. A uh, guy in a the semi, they've got him in jail now. Uh, he shot at a lady. Uh, they got him stopped at uh, right. the plumbing place. Oh, Great. At Graves Brothers. And so they've got him in jail. <laughs> And I'm almost afraid to get out on the road. You, know, you never know. When it starts happening in a county like this, it's kind of bad. <laughs> it's telling you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. All the things that we received of you were so undeserved. And I pray, Father, for these that are of our fellowship, that their bodies are afflicted, that they're sick. And I pray, Father, that you would touch them, make them whole, and refresh them in your love and in your goodness and in your might. We pray, Lord, uh, for Celia as she goes this week, that you would give her traveling grace and mercy, that you would deliver her back safely to us, watch over, guide us, and keep us in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. What I'm going to say tonight, and we'll probably say again Sunday morning, because everybody needs to hear it. Right outside of Chicago, you may have seen this, that they have a transsexual, a transgender boy that says he's a girl. And in junior high, they let him play on the girls' uh, uh, softball, volleyball, basketball. He played as a girl because in his mind, he said he was a girl. And I wasn't aware of these things. But you know the law is if you are a transgender person that you can go, if you think you're a woman, you can go in the women's bathroom. If you think you're a man, you can go in the man's bathroom. And even though your anatomy says that you're not, if you think. So this boy, which thinks he's a girl, is in high school now. And now our government passed the law, it came down yesterday, <coughs> that she, he, it, whatever, has the right to go into the dressing room of the girls. So the school said, all right, we'll comply, but we're going to put a curtain up for her that she can dress and undress and shower there. The ACLU said, no. That's discrimination. So our government says that everybody that goes in there and her, which is a he, that they have to have open exposure. That's the law. So if you, if me being a man, said, I think I'm a woman. By law, I could use the women's facilities and you couldn't say anything about it. Our present administration has slipped a lot of things under the rug that we don't know. Saw this, that 28% of the millennials, this is the young people, 22 in that area there, aren't affiliated and don't want to be affiliated with Christianity. And the reason is three things. Because we as Christians, we do not believe in abortion. Number two, we do not believe in men marrying men, women marrying men. And number three, we do not believe in homosexuality should be legalized. And because we take these stands, we have discriminated against them, so they choose not to worship God because God is not that kind of God that would discriminate against them having freedom of choice in what they want. Now, folks, it's on its way. And all this started when our Supreme Court passed the ruling and said it is legal for men to marry men and women to marry women. It's no longer when you fill out your birth certificates. It's no longer the husband and the wife. It's, it's parent one and parent two. Now the new thing is that they not refer to anyone as 
as a boy or as a girl in school, they should be considered purple. Neutral color. So we're going to get to the place, folks. I'm telling you, it's coming quick. Uh, I'll tell you what. If I, my, which our girls have grown well, they're old. But if our girls were in school and I was in that school, I promise you, I'd take them out and home school. Finish throughout. So we've got to be careful. Uh, these things, are they slip in the back door on us. We don't even know they happen. They pass laws, rules, regulations, executive orders, and, and we're, just, uh, we're just here. And then one day they show up and say, this is the law. Okay. I just needed to inform you. If you turn to this book of Romans, 6th chapter, uh, we got down to the 20th verse. Let me rehearse just a minute what we uh, covered this far. He tells us when we get saved that we should imagine in our minds that we have had a death, that we have died, and that uh, we are no longer the servant of sin. Sin has no more power and dominion over it. And the reason is because when we accepted Christ, we <clears throat> accepted his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So we being in Christ, we are a new person. So sin has no power over us. And I can remember this so vividly. It's been all these years since I've been saved. But I thought when I got saved, how am I going to quit cussing? How am I going to quit drinking? How am I going to quit? And I started naming the things in my mind. How am I going to quit that? But you know, those things never bothered me. Those things never bothered me. That was created in me when I got saved. I became a new person. I saw out of new eyes, I thought with a different mind, and I, I didn't want, desire to do those things anymore because I had been born again of the Spirit of God and I wanted to do right. And I didn't find it hard to do right. It's because I wanted, I wanted to do right. And so Paul goes on and writes, and he says, uh, since we've been saved, since we've been saved by grace, and we're born again by the Spirit of God. He says that should we go on in sin, should we let sin take control of our lives? Y'all come right on. We're waiting on you. Should sin have dominion? Should sin have power over us any longer? And Paul says it like this in the 15th verse. He says, God forbid. Since we've been saved by grace, we are free from sin. We have a, uh, we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Uh, we're in the book of Romans, sixth chapter. Uh, I'm just rehearsing right now, so you didn't miss it. No, you're here. That's a good thing. Uh, we'll we'll get be picked up about the twentieth verse. So, sin has no power over us. Because we've been born again, we've been made righteous because we have the righteousness of Christ uh, in our lives. Before that happened, we had no choice. We were the servants of sin. And that's what we did perpetually, over and over and over. And all those years before I got saved, I never thought about it as sin. It was a normal way of life. It's just the way I... I functioned. I didn't know any different. In fact, I didn't want to do any different. There was a time, uh, I guess two or three years before I got saved, uh, we, Barbara and I hadn't been married too long, and how come us to leave this part of the country was that the, the police, we were living in Carroll, and they got word well, they did here in Kentucky. Every time they saw me, they
they would stop me and search me every time. And so it got so hard that I told Barbara, I said, we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to leave, get out of here. Because I got tired of going to jail. <laughs> That's just the plain truth of it. So we left and we moved to Michigan. But one thing I found out, changing zip codes and changing addresses and changing phone numbers did not change me. I, what I thought was going to change me, I just took it along with me because there had been no change in my life. But then, about four years later, uh, I, how come us to move back to Kentucky? I had, uh, I was supervisor at Clark Foot and Transmission Division in Jackson, Michigan. And I was the youngest supervisor that they'd ever had. They had sent uh, me to school to, to uh, help me to be a supervisor. Then they were getting ready to send me and Barbara to Brazil uh, that I might set up a machine shop there. And so, uh, when you're young, you're young and dumb, right? It takes years before you mature enough to have any sense. And the superintendent of the plant, he and I got into it, and so I told him that's it. And I said a few more words beside that, and I came home, and I picked Barbara, she was working, I picked her up from work, and I said, I moved to Kentucky, and she said, I'm not going. I said, suits me fine. You just stay if you want to. I'm gone. Now that, that, that's what, those are the words that I said. I'm gone. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense. At that time, in, in uh, 1967, making $20,000 a year, which was a lot of money. I came back here and took a job for $1.85 an hour. <laughs> now that's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> that, I mean, that's economics. But I didn't know that there was a plan in, in the working that God had in my life. That didn't make any sense to me. And I was willing to forsake life, whatever. I thought, if I moved here, I moved there to get pressure off, and no pressure came off, so I'm going to move again to get pressure off. But God had a plan. I got saved. God called me to preach, and I became a new person. Now I don't get nervous when I see police. <laughs> I still do have this one thing. If I go to a restaurant, I've got to get my back to the wall. I still do that to this day. I've still got to get my back to the wall. I can't sit out in the open, and I've got to be facing where the door is where I see who's coming and going. Now, you think an old man is tired. You'd get over that. But, folks, habits are hard to get rid of. So what I'm just trying to say to you is this. When God saves you, he changes you. Your likes your dislikes, your agenda, uh, your personality, everything about you changes when you get saved. And you start wanting to do right. I call getting saved is getting your want to fixed. Most people are like me. They say, well, I don't want to. Well, when you get saved, you want to. Things are different in your life. So we were servants to sin before we got saved. But when we got saved, then we become servants to righteousness, which creates holiness, and holiness is separation. So we separate ourselves from the ungodliness that we used to do. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus. The 18th verse says, being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. 20th verse for when ye were, now underline those, those words, for when ye were, now that's telling us we used to be somebody that we're not anymore. When we were past, something that is back there that we have left. For when you were servants of sin, 
you are free from the righteousness of God. Now Paul is going to build a case and he's going to show us something. And the thing that he's going to bring to mind is, is who we serve. Second thing is that when we were sinners, we had no righteousness in us at all. That sin that we had, which was being born of Adam and then our choices to sin, kept us separated from the righteousness of God. 21st verse is a verse that's hard to bear. What fruit have ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Now let me ask you a question. Before you got saved, can you remember anything that you did that you don't want anybody to know about? Why? It starts with an A. We just read it. You're ashamed of it. You're ashamed of it. You're ashamed because you know now how, oh, here's my favorite word, how ignorant you were. How stupid that you were for doing some of the things that you did. Now, we were safe till we moved back to this part of the country when our girls, when we came off road and took Washington Avenue Baptist in Carroll. Then our girls began to get around people that knew their daddy when their daddy boy got saved. And the girls would come home and they would say, Daddy, I met so-and-so today that knew you. And I think, oh, my Lord. And then they would say, Daddy, you know what they told me? And I'd say to myself, oh, Lord, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> now, the seed that you have sown as a person before you got saved, they're going to still be around. In fact, they're going to come up. When I was a little boy, uh, we were planting a garden. I'd probably not, I'd probably six years old. And Daddy had me setting onions. Have any of you ever put onion set to the ground? Yeah. I, we had enough onions to bed the cat. I never set so many onions on my, on my knees, pushing those things to the ground. Uh, I got so tired, I got to the far end, I looked around, mother was up at one end, daddy was over on the other side, and Mary Lou, she was in the house, she always had a side name. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I did. She'd always have a side name, she'd go to the house, and it was this day, I fell over on the ground and grabbed my side, and I said, oh, mother said, what's wrong with you? I said, my side's hurt. She said, Get up. Your side don't hurt. I said, well, Mary Lou's does. She said, well, she's a girl. <laughs> well, I knew she was a girl, but what did that have to do with it? So I couldn't trick out on anything. So I set the onions, and I got tired, and I decided nobody's looking. I'm going to bury the rest of these things. So I just dug a hole, put them all in, and smoothed it out, looked good, and I said, I'm done. Look good. Now, we got a couple of days of rain. <laughs> now, the stupidity of a kid, I didn't think in advance of what the consequences was going to be of the hole that I dug and put all the sets in. My daddy, a few days later, said, Glenn! Now, if he ever said Glenn, business was going to pick up because my, he always called me Bud. And I went out and he standing there at the hole that I dug and covered up, little clusters of little green things sticking up all over. He said, what is that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> well, it looked like all that road down through there. Now, that's what he's talking about. I was ashamed of that. I was really ashamed because it got caught. I wasn't ashamed for putting it in the ground, but it got caught. Things that we do in life, they're never going to go away even though God forgives us and we get saved. There are still consequences that we'll pay all the days of our lives 
for the things that we do do. God will forgive and forget, but man never will. <coughs> and you never will. The hardest thing, and I'm going to preach on this one day, the hardest thing as a Christian is learning to forgive yourself. We live in defeat because we, we know that God's forgiven us, but we cannot forgive ourselves. And it's like a loop in our minds. The things we've done wrong plays over and over and over and over, and it keeps us from having the power of God in our lives. I don't know whether you know what I'm talking about or not. But it, 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 it is a rock. So, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from the righteousness of God. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Now, those things we're ashamed of are the things we did before we got saved. For the end of those things is death. Not salvation, not eternal life, but if we had all continued to live as a sinner and not choosing to be saved, we not only would die physically, but we would die an eternal death that would separate us from the love of God to dwell in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. The 20... First verse, what fruit had you then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now, underline those two words, but now, underline the third word, being, but now, but now, but now, being, Underline the fourth one, made, made, free from the sin, and become servants of God, and ye, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now there's a transition. There are two people that's involved. There's the natural man and the spiritual man. Now, whether or not you know it, you're looking at two folks up here. I can just see one of you. Well, I can see both of me. I can just see one of you, but you can see both of you, right? right. You know yourself as that natural man, and you know yourself as that spiritual man. Now, the fruits that you bore as a natural man, you're ashamed of. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want anything to do with it because it is a disgrace to the new man. It hurts the new man that you are since you've been born again of the Spirit of God. It brings harm from, uh, to him. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruits unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So since you've been saved, what do you want to do? I want to walk right, talk right, live right, be right. That's why that you got up from whatever you was doing tonight and came to church. That's why Sunday mornings you get up and you come to church. Sunday nights you come to church. Why? You're looking not only to sustain your life, but to grow. You're looking to be uh, become stronger, becoming more powerful, becoming more energetic in the Lord. The more you learn of Him through His Word, the more power you begin to unleash in your life. You begin to see, hey, I don't have to succumb to that anymore. I am an overcomer. And the reason I'm an overcomer is because Jesus overcame the death and the grave and I now have his righteousness, which I'm clothed with, and I'm his, and he is mine, and I have been set free, been set free from sin. And so sin has no more dominion over me. Sin has no more power over me. And everybody said, Amen. 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 I thought this so much. I've spent a lifetime learning what I've learned. 
when I was a young Christian, nobody ever taught me this. How I would have loved to have a pastor or a teacher that would have sat and just opened the scripture to me and showed me some of this. Man, I stumbled and fumbled and <laughs> thrashed, trying, trying to get along. I, I tried to endure, I tried to get stronger, but I didn't know. You can't get strong if you don't have nourishment, right? Unless you have food, you're going to be a weakling. And I didn't want to be a weakling, but didn't know how uh, other to be that because I didn't get any kind of food. So now we've got eternal life, we've got righteousness, and we are heaven bound. 23rd verse, for the wages of sin is death. Now you get a job. One of the first things that people want to know. If you hire me, how much are you going to pay me? I've had people to tell me, well, I wouldn't work for what you work for. My daddy told me, he said, if you can make a dollar, make it. If you can't make a dollar and you can make 50 cents, make it. If you can't make 50 cents and you can make a quarter, make it. He said, if you don't, you'll be broke. But if you have that, you won't be broke. So that makes sense to me. So my, when I graduated from high school, my dream was to get a job to make $100 a week. I thought if I could make $100 a week, I will be the richest man in the world. That didn't last long. When I got to making 100 I needed 200 Now I got 200 I needed 400 400 I needed 600 I thought, when's this thing going to quit? <laughs> Man, it don't. It just goes on and on. Every time you get a raise, I'll guarantee you taxes will go up. Did y'all go vote yesterday? <laughs> Did you vote for the tax raise? <laughs> you didn't know it was on the ballot? <laughs> they said last night, that the tax in Ballard County was defeated until they counted the votes at Kevin. Are you kidding me? I didn't even know it was on there. You're kidding. That's what no, I'm, I'm not. It was the last thing on the ballot. It was up at the right on your ballot. And they said the tax was defeated until they counted Kevin. And I, I said, oh, Lord, have mercy. What did our bunch do? <laughs> we blame it on me. <laughs> I'm Mark Mack. I'm Mark Mack. Now, when they go get seven cents out of your check, don't you complain. <laughs> now, the wages, the things that you get for your labor. Now, think of this. If you are a sinner, you are the servant of the devil. Now, what is Satan going to give you for being his servant? What's his payment? Notice, for the wages of sin is death. What kind of death is he talking about? Well, I know we're all going to die, so it can't be that. He's not talking about physical death. That was established when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. God said that all would die. But he's talking about a spiritual death. We as people in the world do not know what it is to live without the presence of God. Ever since we've been born, the Spirit of God has been present. God has had his people, his churches, his ministers, his people talking about him. The presence of God is everywhere because he lives in us and we're everywhere. But if you've never been saved, if you've never been born again of the Spirit of God, you don't know anything about that. But when the church is gone, the world's going to experience something that it's never experienced before because the presence of God is going to be taken out. For the wages of sin is death. That means eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift 
I love this. But the gift of God is eternal life through, eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So now two men, natural Glenn, spiritual Glenn. Because I'm spiritual Glenn, the natural Glenn has no power on the spiritual Glenn. And all the things I did and have done as natural Glenn does not affect me, spiritual Glenn, in the presence and in the eyes of God. I am still judged today by people that know me as natural Glenn. But in the presence and the eyes of God, natural Glenn is dead. Come on now. Yeah. He's dead. So in the spiritual Glenn, I've got to look over at the natural Glenn and I've got to say to him, you don't exist, you're dead. You cannot determine what I do as spiritual Glenn. Because natural Glenn, you're dead. I'm a new person. A new person. And even though the world don't know that, I can't tell you one thing. They do know I'm different. They know that I'm different. Why? Because I got born again. I had a spiritual encounter with God, and I'm different. Same thing with you. Same thing with you. You're not the same person. You are a new creation. Made bright. God didn't make you over. He birthed you over. He didn't remodel you, reshaped you. He made a new birth. And now that's why you want to come to church and hear an old man. <laughs> Now that's why you'll endure and put up with me when I kick, slobber, yell, scream, holler. You say, hey man! Why? Because you had a new birth. And then you are associating what I'm saying because you have had an experience like I have and this Bible comes alive. All I am is a newsboy. I just delivered the news. See, it's all, anybody ought to be able to do that. It's printed. All I've got to do is read it and deliver it. Read it and deliver it. I don't add to it. Don't take away from it. It's not my words. And that's why I can feel very comfortable. Visiting yesterday, uh, I had one lady say, well, do you know, and I was asking about a person that uh, is a member of our church and I've talked to many, many times, and I said, well, they promised me that they'd be there. And they said to me, do you know why they quit coming? I said, no, I don't. Well, I'm going to tell you. I said, well, lay it on me. And they said, do you remember when you preached so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? I said, well, not really, but I know I did. They got mad. I said, well... I really don't know what to do about that. I said, if they can show me what they're believing is in this book, then I'll apologize. But when I can take and show them what I'm preaching in this book, I owe them nothing. And the problem is that they want to continue to live the way that they want to live instead of conforming to the way God wants them to live. See now, folks, there's a, let me see, if you drink, you drink, if you cuss, you cuss, if you smoke, you smoke, if you lie, you lie. I have got to answer to you, for, to God for you. I'm not going to judge you, but you're judging yourself, and you're going to give an account to God. So, I was a real drinker. Before I got saved, I would drink a fifth of Jack Daniels and a case of slips every day. A real drinker. Miss Barbara will tell you of a morning uh, when I'd wake up, I kept a fifth there beside the bed and she'd uncork it and hand it 
to me and I'd get me a good cut of it before I got up. I was ready to go then. So since I like to drink and since drinking had such a power on me, I said after I got saved, I said, Miss Barbara, I don't think there's anything wrong with me drinking as long as I don't get drunk. <laughs> Sounds good to me. How about you? I really, that, you know, it's up to me. Just because I had that thought, God didn't say, zap it. God said, all right, but you'll change your mind when I get you a little further down the road. You know what I'm talking about? So God started getting me a little further down the road. Then I said to Miss Barbara, I don't think it would be anything wrong if I just drank a beer ever now and then. God didn't say, kill him, get him out. God said, he's going to be all right. Got to get him a little further down the road. So he kept leading me on, kept putting that in me. And then one day I told Miss Barber, I said, you know, I can't drink. She said, why? I said, it's wrong. I said, I got convicted. Oh, convicted. What is that? Listen to me. If you never hear anything else, I'll say, I am not God. I am not the Holy Spirit. God is God and will always be God. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of God and He lives in you and He'll always abide in you. See, we evolve in our Christian life. When we start out, we're young and dumb and babies and don't know nothing. But the more the Word gets in us and the more God opens up, we start this growth process. And that's why as you get further and further along, you'll see there's things in your life that causes a hindrance to your testimony. And so what have you got? The only thing you've got is your testimony. So as God began to get me a little further along, I began to develop a testimony. What was my testimony? I got saved. Since I got saved, I've started growing. Since I've started growing, I started leaving things and putting things out of my life that was a hindrance to the growth of my testimony. So Miss Barbara had not had to worry about me drinking. That's a good thing, wasn't it, Barbara? That's a good thing. Man. I can't tell you. See, we Baptists, we're, we're bad. I used to be a name caller. I'd call every service, I'd call sin by name, and I would blast you. And if you didn't walk like me, talk like me, and act like me, you better get right. You know what you call that? Legalism. Legalism. If you do something just because I tell you to do something, you will never have any conviction. And if you do it just because I tell you to do it, without knowing why you're doing it, you will never have any conviction about anything. And you know what conviction does? It builds character. You say, you're a character. I know I am. <laughs> but I'm not talking about that kind of character. I'm talking about it'll develop a backbone. It'll develop love. It'll develop strength. It'll develop power in your life. And it will bring a joy like you've never known. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Next week we're going to start at the seventh chapter. Now, the seventh chapter, let me fill you in. I'm going to give you a hint. Seventh chapter is on marriage and divorce. But don't get lost. I've seen people take this scripture and make a doctrine out of it. Don't get lost. Find out what Paul's saying. Now what the first six chapters, what have we been dealing with? 
the natural man and the spiritual man. Been dealing with law and with grace. We've been dealing with who are you the servant of? You have liberty now. So now he's not going to change horses in the middle of the street. But he's going to use a part of the law, a commandment of the law, in order to show us about the natural man and the spiritual man. About the law, the 613 commandments, and Calvary, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. That's the continuity of the scriptures of what he's going with. Okay. Let's stand together.